Hey all, this is O One Two Boku and having too much fun, Jarek. <laughs> oh yes, Jarek loves to have fun. Yes, I do. And, and, you know, until the cops show up and tell me to stop. Honest which, mistake. <laughs> which uh, was three times this afternoon, but we won't get into that. Oh, okay. But we are continuing, guys, the episodic odyssey of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Right here with a pretty sad and somber episode. Not really that much comedy in between and stupid advertisements I'll just say right now my computer's been swamped with them so if you see me get agitated that's what I would get agitated with hey look at that the Biden administration didn't kill John McAfee he's on your computer indeed <laughs> but um basically it is the episode of episode 16 of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood footsteps of a comrade in arms to give the basic plot it is where uh well, to give you the one side plot of this episode, it's where basically uh, Ling Yao gets lost again, passes out, and he gets arrested for not having a visa while his two peep friends look for him, Lan Fan and old, old Man Fu. You know, isn't it sad that their kingdom has better border security than ours? Yeah, well, because, you know, and, and you know what? They weren't mean. They asked him legitimately... Do you have a, uh, do you have a, uh, what was it, a transport visa or something like that? Yep. You know, do you have a, do you have a transport visa? And then Ling Yao starts, like, having the sweat bullets, and then he's, like, carted away crying, and he can't do anything because he's hungry, and, yeah, I don't know if that's a joke on Asian cuisine or how little they eat or whatnot, as the stereotype is, but, you know, he's not doing anything. He's just, I'm crying as I get carted away. Goodbye. And they literally say, Watch out, everyone! Illegal alien coming through. Yep, <laughs> that's, that's racist. Not, yeah, believe me, that's not me. You know, making it up. If you guys are curious about that, look up episode sixteen of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood: Footsteps of a Fallen Comrade in Arms, and they literally say that, both in English and Japanese. And you know, the funny thing is, he probably could have just said he was a political refugee and not disclose his country, and he would have been fine. Yeah, well, yeah, all he needed to do was uh, say he was a prince of so-and-so and not divulge too much, and they probably would have been too scared to do anything. Yep. Because it would have caused a shitstorm, probably. Because, as you know, with emperors, if any of their family got caught, oh, there was a shitstorm. A pretty big shitstorm from history and all that jazz. But, um, anyway, that was the side plot. I figured I'd get that out of the way really quick. Because that was fairly quick and really had nothing to do with the rest of the story. Other than Lin Yao, uh, before he passes out, noticing that there's something wrong with the country he's in. Which, obviously, as you guys probably know by now, there is homunculi and everything else running around. And a man called Father. But, let's see. This episode pretty much deals with the Elrics returning... And excited to be back in Central because they want to report to their friends, the Fuhrer, and everybody else what they found on, you know, uh, what, what, what was it? Uh, oh, Greed, Greed's base and what they discovered with the Philosopher's Stone. Little do they know, though, uh, Roy Mustang has been looking into it further himself. He has Vato Fallman, you know, um, hanging out, and they're still watching over number 66 or Barry the Chopper because apparently they're still... Hanging on him as proof of Laboratory 5 is what I'm guessing. You have Roy Mustang wanting to look into what happened to Hughes in Laboratory 5 as well. Sheska's covering for him. Other people are covering for him. Yeah, and he kind of pulls a Ling Yao in the, in the, uh, in the fucking storeroom. Yeah, storage room 3 where Sheska has to nervously cover and not let anyone in there. Little do they know, side note, um, Captain Fokker was there. One of, uh, one of, uh... Hughes' men, and that was actually Endy in disguise listening in, so they know what's going on. Yeah, and it's actually kind of neat. She, uh, uh wait, is he, Envy a girl or No, it's, it's he. Everybody oh, says okay. she, though, because it's, it's, but well, let's see, I have it here. Envy's written, Envy in Japanese is done by Minami Takayama and Wendy Powell, so in both versions, Envy is voiced by a woman, but Envy is a man. Eh, 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 Envy looks like a lady. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, like a lady. <laughs> he's, uh, 
his impersonation of Fokker is actually really good and frankly downright spot on. He, you know, he basically pinpoints how the why the who why the lady's covering, uh, who she's covering for, how he strong armed her into it. It's actually pretty goddamn clever and neat to see just how intelligent Envy is. Yeah, and and you get the subtle hints as fans as you watch that something weird is going on. I, I mean, it, it took me by surprise the very first time I thought this. I thought, I thought Fokker was going to be a human plant for uh, the Fuhrer, but it turned out to be Envy. I mean, either way, it was still incredible. But, you know, if Fokker gives away subtle hints, and then as you see, as Fokker walks away, we see the other Captain Fokker come up, and then Envy you know, realizes this and has to change into a completely different person, and then Fokker's like, hey, good morning, Envy, and I'm, or no, oh, good morning, Cheska, and Cheska's like, wait, did I already talk with you? <laughs> kind of setting the stage for some things, you know? Yeah, but either way, you know, it continues, um, Roy Mustang lets uh, Major Armstrong know about what he found and about what he discovered, and they're both telling each other to be careful, you know, that they're entering waters most dangerous, and then, as you can imagine... You have Winry uh, running off to go see, uh, oh, great Gracia, Hughes' wife, and Alicia, and to see if Hughes is home. And you have the Elrics looking for Hughes, to which, uh, like, Hawkeye doesn't say anything, but, you know, Roy Mustang comes out uh, right by Hawkeye and says, you know, oh, he retired to the country to take over his family's business. You know, and, he, uh, won't, he won't be coming back. By the way, when uh, Winry goes to see uh, Gracie, she buys a big basket of apples. It's a bit of a callback to a previous episode where she mentioned how much she loves uh, Hughes' wife's apple pie and how she wants to learn how to cook it as good as her so that one day he can try it. Yeah. Again, setting up for things in the background. And, uh, and again, you know, um, what happens to, and, and I think this is before, uh, oh, wait, yeah, like after they tell that, you know, they run into uh, Maria Ross, and Maria Ross is just sort of like... Uh, like, telling him, like, oh, yeah, sorry, I'm getting a little high myself. The colonel and uh, Hawkeye walked away. Hawkeye doesn't know why the, you know, colonel, or, yeah, Roy Mustang didn't tell him. And he's like, you know, while well, I'm treating him gently, you know, Hawkeye says it's cruel. I can see both their points, but I can see why Major Armstrong and also, uh, keep wanting to say Hawkeye, uh, Mustang didn't say anything, is because the fact that, you know, they're kids. Yeah. They would take it very badly, and as we get to it, they do. And, and also, Roy realizes that the reason why Hughes probably got killed was he was helping the Elrics to look into the Philosopher's Stone. He got too close, and somebody iced him. Good, good point. I forgot to mention that there. It's a nice save, Jarek. Thank you very much. And, you know, that's what happens. And, you know, they're sort of disappointed they can't see him. Maria Ross comes in, sadly starts spilling the beans, you know, the... Elbricks are being naive because they're like, oh, he was promoted. Oh, he was given this. Well, that's quite an offer for just retiring. And then, um... And then she gets this look on her face like, oops, I said the wrong thing. Well, yeah, they like, didn't like, know. Like, like that, like the shock face of... And, and, you know, and that's what tips them off. And then, sadly, after that, we see when we go to the Hughes' home. And then, you know, you have... Great, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah or no, you have... El, El, yeah, Alicia come out and go, Daddy. And, you know, the whole... Yeah. sad shit there and, it's, and then she starts crying in her lap and and then that's when she finds out and then basically we hear the voiceover of Ross telling the Alrics what happened and Edward runs off distraught I mean Alphonse is probably distraught about it too but Edward feels really bad because you know he's like we got you into this you're dead this is our fault you know, how could we have not been, how could we have not seen this coming? We should have told you to stay out of it. So it's a huge, he feels guilt. And I'll give, I have to hand them real credit here. The dialogue they gave Gracie Hughes when she's telling them not to give up on their search because if they did, it would basically invalidate what her husband tried to do. And she even says something akin to, uh, you know, it would be his way to die while trying to help someone else. He was always that way. He was always, you know, getting himself hurt trying to help other people. And that's just the kind of person he was. And honestly, if you've ever spent time around veterans, this is a very, very similar thing you will hear to the uh, wives of veterans who have passed away in wars. And it's heartbreaking. I mean, you see Winry holding her daughter 
her daughter has clearly cried herself to sleep. The wife is telling them, you know, you can't, you cannot stop doing this because he tried to help you with this. This is like his last legacy. You have to keep going. Yeah, because his death would have been in vain. And uh, they, and she goes forward to say, you know, not not only, you know, not only Jarek did she say that he died helping other people. When they get there, you know, they're feeling bad. And Alphonse and Edward also tossed around how Edward feels guilty. But Alphonse is like, you know, hey, if we're going to lose more friends to this process, I don't want my body back. It's not worth losing people over and then that's where she also where Gracie I, I she must have learned it from Mustang or someone must have told her but she knew that Hughes was looking into the Philosopher's Stone because she uh, says that's what he was doing and and we know she didn't know at the time but someone must have let her know what happened and that's when she says you boys keep going yeah because if you don't my husband would have died in vain and in many ways, it's sort of like, if you don't keep going and that happens, I'm not going to forgive you. And you can see how badly this affects not only the Elrics, but Winry. Because later that night, Elric, uh, Edwards, you know, he's tr he's eating and he's waiting for uh, Winry. And he can tell she hasn't eaten and he goes to her room and she spills the reason why she got the big basket of apples. Was she wanted to try to bake a... Uh, the, what was her name again? Uh, uh, oh, she wanted to bake uh, Gracia's uh, apple pie recipe so Hughes could try some because she yeah. was hoping because uh, she says how she spent a lot of time at her house when they went to Rush Valley together and all that type of stuff, learning how to do it. She's like, it's silly, it's stupid, I know, but I was hoping you could try it one day. And and also, what was sad and cool about the scene was that. She was sort of standing there stoic. She grabs Ed by the hand when Ed's trying to walk away, saying, okay, maybe she wants to be alone. She grabs him by the auto mail hand, brings him in, tells him the story. So, again, nod to furthering the relationship, too, as well. And, you know, it's just a sad scene, and it really hits home right there. And, oi, you know, it's like, it's hard thing to be recalled, because if you can tell, I get a little mushy in the voice. But, hey, it happens, and... Um, Alphonse, too, they, they really focused on Winry and Winry's feelings, but Alphonse, all you see of him, too, is he just sits mm. in the room slumped forward like that, and, you know, just like that, well, see, like I said, Jerry, the advertisements are relentless, so, yeah, I, I don't know what's happened ever since we've hit 2022, I've had endless advertisements, you know, which, which, believe me, I'll tell you on a side note, folks, if you click on any of these advertisements, I hope you have virus protection on your computer, because when I did it for the insurance ones... It brought up a warning of a virus, so yeah, don't don't fully click on those things at all, because I think there are a bunch of virus traps, and I think this is the next wave of them trying to track us on our computers if we're smart to not be tracked on them. And remember, children, if you get an intriguing offer from a Nigerian prince, just remember that he was working with Jesse Smollett. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and let's see, like the plot goes forward still, and what happens is is you actually oh. Oh, well, actually, we'll get to that in a minute, too, because that actually ties into the ending. But what happens is, is that Winry, or not Winry, uh, Lust and Envy with Gluttony are talking about how the colonel's getting too close. He keeps looking into matters he shouldn't be. He's an important sacrifice. We can't kill him. You know, we need to do something about him. Like, Lust is saying she's going to go meet her new boyfriend to get information, and, uh, and, uh, Oh, yeah, and he's like, wait a minute. Like, oh, yeah, because, shoot, I'm getting it jumbled here again. Oh, yes, Gluttony left a pile of bones on the ground. Lust looks at the, or no, Envy looks at the bones and says, hey, you know what? You know how we get the colonel to behave? We give him a bone to chew on. And what better way to keep a dog at bay, huh? Or something similar to that notion. And sadly, then we see, um, a officer named, uh, Henry Douglas from the Profs office come up and say, you know, uh, Maria Ross here wanted in for questioning of the death of Brigadier General Hughes. And, you know, she's shocked and upset that she's even being considered, you know, it's absurd. She worked closely with him too. She would have never killed him, but that's what they did. They're setting up Maria Ross for a frame to keep uh, Colonel Mustang at bay. And Colonel Mustang saw this and he took the bait and bit it. And then sadly towards the end, at the beginning of the episode where this ties in, where uh, Jean Havoc is meeting with Vato Fallman, where he's watching over number 66, he tells 
of, of Rata Fallman in a hilarious way. Hey, I have a new girlfriend. She's so nice. She's so lovely. Comedic stuff at best. You know, number 66 wants to kill her and chop her up into pieces. And then, sadly, we learn is he's got gotten a bouquet. He's in a nice suit, you know, puts a cigarette out for her. Goes to meet his new girlfriend at the cafe at the very end of the episode. And it's Envy. No, no, it's Lust. Or, or, sorry, Lust, like, ah, darn you, Envy with the female voice. <laughs> but there's a, there's also another funny thing we learned from Lust and Envy during their little chat. We learned that they were the ones who who were actually responsible for getting Roy Mustang to transfer to, uh, to uh, oh, Central. Oh, you're right. I forgot that a little bit, Jarek. Thank and you. And I even love how they mentioned, you know, I thought moving him to Central would make it easier for us to keep an eye on him and keep him under control. But now it looks like he's doing a little too much snooping and getting too close to things he not be sniffing around in. Yep, you're, you're right. I completely forgot about that, Jarek. Good save again. Thank you very much. I um, no worries, man. And you, know that, and, you know, that's how it ends. So the homunculi probably at father's behest has been in control of the military and way ahead of them this entire time. So you think that the humans got one up? Nope. And, yeah. let's, and let's see, that is the basic plot, and as you can see, very somber, very sad, a very good episode for moving things forward. You sort of had a fun one the last time, and now it's back down to the sad and getting things you know, maybe, heading uh, forward. Maybe if they want to stop Father, they should just alchemize him some Rocky Road. Yeah, you fight with Grandpappy, I'm going to go get me the good stuff. Yeah, and let's see. On to characters now for characters who uh, stood out in this episode. I would definitely have to say, um, I mean, there's a lot, but if I had to say the ones that really uh, got to me in this episode, I would say if I had to pick two of them, because like I said, there's so many who had good performances. I'm going to definitely go with, um, well, actually, no, three of them. Edward Elric, uh, Romy Paku, Vic Mignogna, both in Japanese and English. Um Really well done. Really um, set the stage. Um, I liked Romy Paku's emotional play a little bit more than Vic Mignogna's. I think Romy Paku brought it out a little more. Not to say that what Vic Mignogna did was bad. It's just that I think Romy Paku brought it out a little bit more. So I get, like I told Jarek when we saw this episode, give the edge a little bit more to the Japanese language in this one because Romy Paku, I think, brought out a little bit more of the emotion than Vic Mignogna did. But... Vic Mignogna was still great and spot on, showing how distraught he was about what happened about Hughes, how upset he was, how off he felt. Um, where was her? Because it, uh, you guys probably find this a little out of place for me, but Gracia Hughes, mm. Tomoe Hanba, and Anastasia Munoz, when she's talking about how she felt and how she wants the boys to keep going, spot on in my opinion, very heartfelt, you know, She's dealing with the pain, you know, and trying to keep it all in. And sadly, we didn't mention this, but when they leave the house, she starts crying. And, and Alicia's like, Mommy, don't cry, please. And it's just like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. And, you know, just sad on the field. So great performance for from both those voice actors. Um, I don't know why uh, Tomoe Hanba, you really couldn't hear her cry. It was a bit more subtle, I guess, in Japanese, where... I guess in English they played it up because you could hear Anastasia Munoz a little bit more than Tomoe Hanba. That's just my observation. Maybe I didn't have the volume up enough the first time we watched it in Japanese, but maybe that could have been. And then for number three, because her performance, explaining the apple pie and the whole thing at the end, uh, where, is he, where is she again? I, I should know because we've seen it enough times. Where are you? Just want to make sure I get it right. Where? Oh, when we rock bell. Megumi Takamoto and Caitlin Glass, two really great performances. They really made you feel sad. They made you feel like, oh man, this sucks that she really hit hard. That that's how much the heroes went to her as well. They were a friend of her as well, and it just, it really just hit you. And um, uh, let's see, what was her name once again? Oh yeah, Megumi Takamoto was good. I give her props, but the better performance I think came from Caitlin Glass. Because Caitlin Glass really brought out the emotion, in my opinion. Uh, Megumi Takamoto was more hmm. subtle. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Megumi Takamoto was more subtle. But um, Caitlin Glass really was just very good. And I 
gave her props for that. So that those are my three, just because the performances were sad, they were great, they were somber, they brought everything to the table. That's who I liked. Jarek, how about you? Every I agree with all of them, but uh, I'm going to switch out Edward Elric for uh, what was the name of Gracie's daughter? Oh, uh, Alicia. Jeez. And I'll explain why I'm going with Alicia because again, Vic Mignogna, fucking aces, you know, never turns into bad performance, but. To have to play a kid who lost her father, who's... I mean, the way she was crying Papa when she heard the door, that... Mm. Yeah. That hits a little hard for personal reasons. But I gotta say, whoever did that role, you nailed uh, that shit. Misato, Misato Fuku, uh, Fukuen and Shirami, and Shirami Lee. And that's, Lee. that's the hardest shit to have to do, is to do like the death of a parent, especially for a kid, man. And Gracie, oh my God, she did the the um, the wife who loses a husband in war. I have no complaints about that. That was like, that was one of the best performances I've seen. And uh, again, you know, that's that's one of those really bad performances. You don't want to have to. You don't want to have to do that role. That shit hurts. Oh, uh, just wait, just wait till we get to. Uh, on a side note, just wait till we get to. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, oh yeah, the. Uh... Helsing OVAs and uh, because uh, I've got a story from the audio commentaries that Tally Scene Jaffe, the director, says, Oh, uh, you know, Karen Stressman's like, Oh, I want to play this little girl, I want to play this little girl, let me be the little girl. And he's like, I don't know if you want to be this. She's like, I'll be it. And then she does it, and she's like, Tally Scene, I hate you. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And uh, let me think, what was the third one? Oh, and Winry. And dear God, Winry's performance damn near broke me. That was. Too good. That well, was too spot on. I, I remember, I won't bring it up for the sake of you, Jarek, in case you want to keep it off of the public eye. But yeah, I remember, and I asked if you were all right, and you were. Oh, dude, the only that, was, way. that was tough. That was like right up it, there with some of the best movies I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, well, you and I, you and I, we were both, I mean, like, I mean, I, I, I was close to bursting into tears. I didn't, but I could tell I was feeling depressed and somber and. Again, like you guys heard me while doing this review, just recounting everything, you know, misty voiced and shaky and just, that's how you can tell something gets to me because my voice changes octaves and you can tell by the subtleness of it. So, yeah. And so I agree with the characters and final and final thoughts. I would just have to say great episode to keep bringing it forward. Very sad recollections. Now you've seen the, the Elric's reaction of it. Uh, Roy Mustang is probably in deep shit with them and probably with Winry as well. And, yeah. you know, it's going to be that. But again, who knows if we're going to get to that right away because now we got the stuff with Maria Ross. That was set up beautifully an interesting play. The villains just being complete dicks. And, you know, just the web that they have spun... It was really well done so far. So, to me, it was a great episode. You got anything, Jarek, to add to the final thoughts? You know, I'm just going to say, if you're going to watch this one, bring the Hagen dazs and the Kleenex. You're going to need them. Uh, well, there you go. But, hey, that is our review of Episode 16, Footsteps of a Comrade in Arms. And, you know, again, if you guys have seen this, what do you think? Uh, do you like this episode? Is it one for you? Just leave a comment down below if you want and just let us know. And until then, this is O One Two Boku back to normal again, and Jackass Jerica, and we'll be seeing you again real time. Deuces, deuces, bitches. <laughs>